Hey, um, there's a scripture we read a lot. It's Psalms 27, 13. It says this, I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I just want to remind you that God is working in and among us. And it's your uh, consistency, your dedication to say, no, no, no. I'm a believer who believes that God is and he is st he's, he's still doing things that he began. What he began, he's faithful to complete until we're all brought into perfection. And I don't know about you, but I looked around the room this morning just to double check, and I don't see perfection in here. So that means he's still working. Amen? And so we remain confident of that. He's working among us. He's working through you. Turn to the person next to you. Say, he's working through you. And then tell that person back. Just be nice to that person. Say, well, he's working in you too. Hey, uh, Andy hit on it, but next week we have power and love. Um, if, you're not, if you're not careful, you'll miss it. Can I tell you what's going to happen next week? Next Friday and Saturday, and it's going to overflow into Sunday service, we are having a modern day healing crusade here in Wichita. And we get to host it. It's not something that we've created. Power and loves have been done all over the country. But um, when I was a kid, I actually gave my life to Jesus at a, at a uh, crusade where it, uh, the field house was full of people and they preached Jesus and my, uh, lives were changed. I believe God's going to do that next weekend. This church is going to be full and we're going to preach Jesus. But it's not just for those who know him already. It's for those who are hungry for him, those who are desperate for him. And so if you're not already registered, uh, I just encourage you, tell your boss you're going to take uh, a, a personal day. You know, you can get your oil changed on a Saturday. You can use your personal day uh, for a healing uh, service on Friday and then on Saturday. And then you'll overflow into Sunday. Amen. And if money is an issue, Tiff's going to take care of it. It should never be a reason you shouldn't come to something that God's doing. And if God's put it in you to be there and money's the reason you can't, let us as a church, you can just go to the connect table and say, hey, I want to I be a part of that. Um, and all I got is Dan's $20. We know Dan's got $20, so <laughs> he'll help you out with that, that, at least that portion of it. Amen? I need a loan, Dan. I need a loan, Dan. Already spoken for. Open up your hands as big as you can. We didn't come to hear a man, we came to be present with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is present in this place, not because he remains here, but he lives with you and you brought him in when you came. It's so good to gather as believers because we bring the same Holy Spirit and we bring him in to community with one another and something incredible happens. So let's just make recognition and say what we, what we already have said so many times, but let's just declare it together this morning. Repeat after me, say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Yeah, say, Jesus, you're welcome here. Yeah, put your hand on your heart. He's made you the temple of the Holy Spirit. Same power that rose Christ from the dead dwells in you. Uh, that's hard to be the same. Uh, he has put a game-changing spirit, the fullness of Christ dwells in you. And so we just recognize that. that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so just repeat after me. Say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Yeah, say it again. Say, Jesus, you're welcome here. Yeah, and Father, your love and your goodness, your kindness, yeah, your direction, your correction, everything you have for me, your word, I receive today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was um, powerful things are happening when you saturate yourself with God's love. We, uh, I got to pray with a guy last week here at the church. And I'm telling you, when you grab a hold of the invitation to receive God's love, you can't remain the same. Oh, I was an eight-year-old boy the first time I did it, and I've never been the same since. I was a 20-year-old man when I did it uh, um, again, and I have never been the same since. And whether today is the... Your second day to receive him or your 400th or it's your first time, I promise when you receive the love of the Father, when you hear him knocking and you let him in, that's not just an invitation for salvation, but that's an invitation for healing. That's an invitation for a miracle to happen in your marriage. That's an invitation for miracles to happen in your parenting and in your families and in your finances. And when you hear the door knocking and you let him in, God changes everything. Amen. 
Hey, I want to uh, t- tell you today, um, <laughs> God is, uh, okay, 11 o'clock service, we're doing an ordination service. <laughs> we are, it, it, is, it is very exciting. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it right at the beginning of the 11 o'clock service. And I'm going to preach right up until then so you guys get to be a part of it. You guys good with that? No, even if I don't preach right up until then, we, we're going to do it at the beginning because it's definitely a family moment. And so I just encourage you to spend a few minutes extra, hang, hang with us through the beginning of worship. And it, we're, it's going to be 15 or 20 minutes, but God's going to minister powerfully as we're recognizing what he's doing in this church. We're recognizing what he's doing in this community and we're um, acknowledging the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit among us. And so um, be a part of that uh, at the 11 o'clock service. In the meantime, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you uh, a little story about my first car. Are you guys down for that? How about you open up your Bibles? Uh, open up your notes. Get ready. We're going to go back to first, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 5. Last week we talked just about three simple things we can do while we're standing in the will of God, waiting for the promises of God, the posture of our heart, the position of faith we could be in. I think for the next few weeks, I might just stay right here. Next week, um, Pastor Todd's going to preach. And um, I, uh, after that, I think we're going to come right back to First Thessalonians 5. Anybody read it this week? It's powerful. And I would just challenge you to read it in as many translations as you can. Read it in the Amplified, get all the extra words. Read it in the Passion, get all emotional. Read it in the Message and get ready to share it with your kids. It's incredible. All the different ways you can read it. Read it in the, in the New King James or even the King James and get your these and thys ready. Um, but we're going we're, we're to share just a little bit more from that. Um, I'm going to start by telling you about my car. The first car I had was a beautiful white 1989 Ford, and I so badly want to tell you it was a Mustang, but it was an Escort <laughs> station wagon. Every 16-year-old was dreaming of driving a Mustang. My parents got me a Escort station wagon. And can I just tell you, they were pretty smart. Uh, I don't know what I would have done as a 16-year-old with a Mustang. Um, but they, I, and I'm very thankful for the investment that they made, but I, I'll never forget. It was this uh, it, was, it was white on the outside, all red on the inside, red interiors, like the, more red than the color of the seats that you're sitting in. Um, you guys remember when they made cars with a full red interiors? It was fully equipped with an AM only radio. <laughs> it was awesome. My friends would pull up, bump in the new Fresh Prince and uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, and I am rocking Rush Limbaugh. It was awesome. They were like, uh, why aren't you getting out of the car? I'm like, because Paul Harvey's telling me the rest of the story. I can't get out yet. I'm stuck in storytelling mode. I had all the country radio and uh, AM storytelling. I was very informed as a young man. But I love this car because this car represented freedom to me. I was a kid bound by a bike. And I took that bike. I remember the, the, my 15-year-old year, I rode like 400 miles on that bike. I was getting out of the house as soon as the sun came up. And I didn't come back until mom made me. And I was all over town on my bike. And I thought, I remember my dad, I was, I was like, dad, if I could just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I was dreaming of this like $4,000 mountain bike. And he said, son, just wait till you get a car. You don't need, you're not going to ever think about a bike. And I was like, that's blasphemy. I will never give up my love for the bike. I got this car and I was like, what? That little two-wheel dinky thing, I'm never going back to my Huffy. I was a Huffy, but I painted it black so nobody knew it was a Huffy. <laughs> I never rode, it's still sitting in my mom's garage today. I never rode it again. This car represented freedom to me. I remember it was a, it was a, a manual uh, transmission. My mom wanted me to learn how to drive a manual transmission, but she didn't dare want to teach me how to drive a manual transmission. Uh, it, that, that car, uh, we had a, a great time. I learned the sound of a grinding clutch in that car. I grew up in Missouri where there's hills. You guys don't have those in Kansas, but uh, try to learning. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget where I was sitting when I was, when I was parked at a red light up a hill and they're trusting this 15 and a half year old to learn to go forward without causing a wreck. I didn't know, you don't know this, but you can rear end somebody and be in front of them <laughs> with your rear end. 
the sound, the smell of the grinding clutch, the, 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 the knowing of my dad's disappointment as he sat in the seat next to me. My mom said, I won't teach him. My dad said, I can't teach him. And so they called the, the, this man, his name is Russ Clinky. He was the most holy man. It would be like calling Steve Slate to come teach me how to drive. Uh, uh, and literally the most holy man in our church. And my dad said, you're the only one that has hope to teach him. The, the patience that is going to be needed to teach this man to drive a stick. And sure enough, I remember driving around and the patience that he had. And I learned, and, uh, the, 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 I learned to no longer grind the clutch after replacing it once. And I, I, I began to learn how to operate this car, and I would drive it, and I, it, it was freedom to me. I could get, I had a license on the back of that car. That license meant I could drive it anywhere in the country. I could go anywhere I wanted, and, and although my parents didn't give me that same liberty, I, I knew I had it. It was coming, and it was growing. I could jump on the highway and drive that thing about 55 miles an hour if I stood straight up on it. And uh, I remember it had, a, it, it had a stick shift. You guys are like, what church do we go into? It had, it, it had a stick shift, which meant I could even burn the tires because I could like put that thing and just step on the brake and put it in, in low gear and uh, make all my tire go away in about 30 seconds. Uh, I, I fell in love with this car because of the, what, we, it, what it was to me. And uh, it didn't matter what it was to everybody else. It represented freedom to me. And I remember as I got to learn the car, I, I, I knew the, the, the nicks in it and I knew the dents that it had. And I knew the sounds and the squeaks that it made. You guys remember your first car and how you, like, you, oh, you knew it like a way you, only you knew it. You, I, I, I didn't name the car, but I should have named it because then I could share that with you guys today. Should should have had the foresight to think about that. Um, but I knew everything about this car. I knew, I'll never forget the, the day I realized that you, you could be so in tune with the car that you could hear, you could know where it was at in the engine and no longer have to even use the clutch. You could just slide it into the next gear because you were so in tune. I remember when I got that in tune with the car and I was like, we are mastering each other. And I was so thankful, and we, I, I, I would go everywhere in the car, and as you could imagine, I would load everybody into it. It was a station wagon. That's what it was meant for. And uh, as long as you could handle the AM radio, we were good to go. Actually, I upgraded the AM radio. I had a Walkman that had shock absorbers, and if someone held it, and we tuned to the right frequency, we could listen to the uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince and uh, whatever new Jesus Freak song this was. I, it, the, 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 this was my first experience as a car. Uh, and I loved it. And then I also remember that car becoming common. I remember that car not being as nice as everybody else's and starting to realize what, looking at whatever the people had and what, what feel, felt like freedom started to feel like not enough. What felt like freedom, and I remember pulling up to school the first day feeling like, look, I've got something. And I remember also pulling up to school thinking, you don't think much of what I have. And I went through the season where I was learning her. I went through the season where we knew each other intimately. And then I remember I went through the season where I couldn't wait to get rid of her. I remember trying to sell her to anybody who could because I wanted a Jeep so badly, a, a red two-door sport Cherokee. And if I, all I had to do was sell this car to get to the next car. I remember when I would wash the car when I first got her. And I remember letting dirt and dust from the country roads build up as I had her after a couple years, and uh, she became common to me. And as I, I was reflecting this week about that car, I was really thinking a whole lot about how our relationship with God follows the same way. How when it's all new and it's all fresh and there's something so beautiful about it, and I don't feel like I can do anything right, but I just want to keep doing it. And if somebody will have, if there's a man of God, if there's somebody who will have the patience with me, I think I can master this. I think I can figure this out. How maybe it, it represents freedom to you at the beginning of your relationship with God. And you can do anything, go anywhere. You have permission, even if people in the local church or people around you say, no, 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 don't do that. But you've been given permission from the highest level of God's government to be free, to be unashamedly free and to do things that you never could do on your two-wheel huffy. And there's those seasons where we are so in tune with the Holy Spirit. We're so in tune with God and we feel like his righteousness is on us, that there's nothing we can do to mess it up. 
we, can, we hear his heartbeat and we can respond immediately and there's no friction or frustration. There's no sound of the clutch grinding. It's just perfect momentum going from gear to gear as we go from one destination to the other. And then there's sometimes a season where we just start to take things for granted. We get distracted by what we don't have and what the world has and maybe what that church is doing over there or what that place is doing over there. Man, and, and we get distracted. And this morning, I, the, the real simple message I want to bring to you is it's time to wake up. It's time to fall back in love with the freedom that you've been given in Christ. Here, I want to read this to you at first. Thessalonians, in in chapter 5, it has everything. It talks about the end times and it uh, it talks about living in the current. And um, as he's he's writing to the church, he says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, in verse 4. It says, but you, brethren, you're not in darkness. Uh, So this day, the, the day of the Lord's return, won't overtake you as a thief. You're sons of light and you're sons of day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk, are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on our breastplate of faith and of love as a helmet of hope and salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are already doing. I love that There's in verse 9 in the uh, Passion Translation, it says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. The short of that is God has not destined you. For wrath, God has destined you, say this, God has destined me to possess salvation. This is good news. The freedom that you have, this is the gift. God had a choice. He could either, because of the sin of the world, he, he, we were due to experience his wrath, but he chose to give us his salvation. It's one or the other. It was to choose your own adventure for the Lord. And he said, I'll take the hard way and I'll give my son, my one and only, so they can experience my love all over again. It was an invitation. And in that invitation, there's this declaration in this, in, in this to be sober-minded, to wake up, to be vigilant, to don't be like those who are stumbling around in the night because you're children of the day. You're, in Matthew chapter 5, G- Jesus starts his Revelation teaching by saying you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. Don't hide yourself. Don't, don't, don't pull back. But instead, God is placing you in a place of prominence so the world might experience his goodness. Verse 10 in the Passion Translation says, He gave his life for us so that we may share in his resurrection. resurrection life in union with him. This is the whole purpose. I grew up thinking that Jesus gave his life so that I could have a mansion in heaven. It doesn't say that anywhere. That is the lowest level of belief. Your eternal security is just the beginning. Jesus gave his life and, and you were created for, to possess salvation so that right now, in this day, you could be in union with God. That's what happens. When we experience healing, we've received his love, we're just experiencing a greater union, a display of God's love in our lives. I don't, can I tell you, I don't believe Christians should need miracles. I believe miracles is what Christians should be displaying to the lost so that they could experience the love of God, a taste of the love of God. But we, as Christians, should be experiencing promises. We should be partaking in promises of the Lord. We shouldn't be hoping. A miracle happens sometimes, but it, for, and, and, and we're believing for something supernatural to take place. But a promise, my daughter knows good and well, a promise she can take me up on. She says, but dad, you promised there's, no, there's not a bigger phrase. 
Piper Joy, do you, Piper Joy is in here this morning. Do you ever say that to your dad? Dad, you promised ice cream. You promised after the soccer game we'd get. Do you, do you, ever, do you, ever, do you ever use that language? There, when, I'll tell you what, I'm headed home. I'm on a mission to get something done. I've got honeydews up to here. And Gracie says, Dad, you promised we'd get a Frosty. You're right, kid. I'm turning back around and going to the closest Wendy's. Why? We're children of promise. My job is to display the Father's love, and God has promises for his children to partake in. Healing is your promise. It says it's the children's bread. There's a renewal. We're not just trying to grind until we get to eternity. We have an invitation right now to life union. And can I tell you, our distraction for what we don't have takes away from the promise of what God's already given you. There's an invitation this morning, and as I read in here, it reminds me to wake up to the things of God. Wake up to the favor of God that's already in my life. Wake up to what he's doing. Don't, get, don't let it get common. Don't let it wither away. For he's, if he gave us his life so that we may share in resurrection life, in union with him, whether we're awake or we're asleep. What's that mean? It, it's saying forever and all eternity. Whether your flesh is alive right now or you're in eternity with him, you have been invited in both realms into life union with him. Because of this, encourage the hearts of your fellow believers and support one another just as you've already been doing. Here's what I see in this scripture. I see identity. It starts with you're a child of the light. You are the light of the world. You don't, you're, you don't belong to darkness. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. You don't belong to darkness. Your struggle isn't with God. It's with, it, it, you just need to surrender that place that you never were intended to be and step into the light. This scripture starts with speaking identity in our lives. You belong to the light. And it gives a warning to keep awake, stay alert, be clear-headed. Don't sleep away this moment. It gives instruction to put on the whole armor of God. And we'll get to that in another message. But it says, don't let the world take your super strength. I think about Samson and the story of Samson. And I don't ever hear that story without thinking, what an idiot. I mean, all he had to do was keep this lady from knowing that his hair, God hid his strength beautifully in the story of Samson. He made this strong man ready to defend an entire people. And all he had to do was not cut his hair. And Jezebel's trying to find out, the world's trying to find out what is it that makes him so strong. There's got to be something. And he lets out his super strength and it's taken from him. The story of Samson ends with him begging God for a moment of his power back so that he can do what he was always called to do and defend his people. Man, we, 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 I think so many times, what an idiot. But I think how many times have I given up my superpower? How many times have I laid down the favor of the Lord to search after the things of the world? How many times have I delayed God's promises and his blessing upon my life because I was just wanting a little bit more of the flesh? Just, just a little bit more gossip, just a little bit more, I just want to tell somebody, whatever it is. And it's like, man, it's time to wake up. It's time to put to death the things of the world, to step into the things of God. Put on the whole armor, your super strength that God has given you. Your heart has been made right with God and you receive his love, which is all that you need to be strong. You've been given the mind of Christ. Your hope is in Jesus, the victorious, and the promise of partnership with the Holy Spirit. Then I see it go into a, a, an a exaltation of purpose. It says, God chooses to love you, not to strike you. He could have chosen wrath, but instead he chose love. He, he, you were purposed for salvation instead of wrath. His wrath isn't waiting for you, his love is. For God has destined you to possess salvation through Jesus. Because of Jesus, death, 
Because of Jesus' death, we get to live in union or communion with God. That's why Jesus invites us, as often as you do this, remember this union that you have, this communion opportunity that you have, and it's eternally settled. No matter whether we live or when we die, we will forever be in union with God because we believe. Then it, then it ends with a portion of encouragement. I think this is how we should end our service. It says, it speaks hope into your life. It encourage, he says, speak this hope. Encourage one another. Encourage other believers to think like this. Wake up the church. Stay awake to those who are alert. I, I, I remember that car, doing road trips in that car. And that's where I learned about the buddy system. That's where I learned about the shotgun. That's where I learned there's a driver and there's somebody that stays awake. And got, I think that's ordained by God. And if some of you guys have failed on that, you can repent and just say, oh, I can do better. But I think in, in, in this life, you may be driving towards a thing and you need believers to sharpen you and say, stay awake, stay alert, don't lose focus. You're, already there. You're almost there. We are on track to the place that God has sent us to go. There's purpose in this journey. This scripture encourages me because it reminds me not to make the same mistake I made with my first car. Not to let things get common. Not to let things get, not to be distracted with the things of the world or the things that are out there. But to be thankful for what God's given me. Be thankful for the freedom and my portion of freedom and the invitation that I've been invited into. You guys, there's a, this morning, this portion of scripture calls us not to hard works, not to difficult moments, although there may be some of those in your life. It calls us to stay alert, to stay awake, to don't get distracted by the things of the world, but recognize who you are. Do you know that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High? We're, we're going to ordain people here in just a few minutes. And when we do, whatever titles that are given by men are lower than the greatest titles that have ever been given out, son and daughter of the Most High. When you receive Jesus, you received and you were entered, you enter into his kingdom. And guess what? When he sees you, he's not going to call you by your work title. I've, been, I've done tons of funerals. Can I tell you that very few of them mention any of our work accolades? Almost every one of them recall the camping trips the moments spent, the words that were spoken. We put so much emphasis on the wrong things. And I think this portion of scripture calls us to stay vigilant, to stay awake and late, awake. I know this church, I remember getting revelation. I was just, I think we were here a year. And I was uncomfortable with how many Christians would, would come to this church. I thought churches were just, man, the churches I'd always been a part of, we were going after the lost and the people that didn't know God at all. But all, this church, man, it seemed that people who knew God would come. And that was like un, a little uncomfortable to me. And I remember God saying, there's an anointing on this church to wake up sleeping Christians. Gary and Jeannie Bug testified a year later after that had happened to me, they were a part of our church and talking about how God was doing a new thing in their later years. They got baptized. How old were you guys when you got baptized? 80? 80 years old, they got baptized. Not because they didn't know the Lord, but because they were learning to know the Lord in all new ways. There's a fresh thing happening, and it had to be recognized in the body. I'm telling you, I don't, this, is, this isn't a message I, for, for just those who are young to not get distracted by the world or those who are working to, hey, come back to your families, come back to your first love. This is a message for all of us, those who are retired. There is purpose in this season of your life. Elbow the person next to you and say, stay awake. Not just because of the message, not just because it's, you chose the 9 o'clock service. But stay awake to the things of God. Stay fresh to the hunger because guess what? Your freedom is in that. The move of the Holy Spirit is in that. And somebody else's salvation is in your alertness because you stay ready to display the glory of God.
This morning, I just really, I mean, this message is pretty simple, but it's just an invitation. If you want to awaken to more of what God has for you, I just want you to stand. I think everything that happens good in the, in the Word of God happens through activation. It happens through your faith. And if you're hungry for more of God, you want to stay awake to the things of God, you want that fresh spirit of God, just stand where you're at. Maybe you've never experienced him, and it's like, man, I want it, I want him. Maybe you've experienced him, and you're like, I'm not done. I'm ready to experience all his promises. If he says it, I receive it, and I believe it today. I want to pray for you. Because here's what I believe. I believe as you stand, you're representing, you were destined for this moment. You were destined to receive more of God, to be vessels overflowing with his love. His love is the only atmosphere you need to experience all of his promises. So would you open up your hands? Those standing, just open up your hands. If this is a, your first time to give your life to Jesus, and you're just calling on the name of Jesus and saying, hey, I'm done being in the dark and I'm ready for the light. We're gonna, we, we applaud you and we'd love to pray with you. I'd love to pray with you personally right after service. And for everybody else, I just want to, Open up your hands. Visualize yourself. Think about the prophet that comes to the widow who's there with her son preparing their last meal. They've got a little bit left for one more meal and then her plan is to lie down and be with the Lord. The prophet comes in the room and says, can I, can I have some of that? Would you share it with me? She says, you don't understand the moment that you just walked into. You don't understand the place that I'm in. You don't understand the brokenness of the household that you just entered. And I know that sometimes we can be more aware of our brokenness than we can of what God wants to do as he enters the situation. But I want you to understand God knows perfectly the person that he's destined to receive his love. And it takes a, a move of faith. And he says... Would you just, would you just share it with me? She sort of shares it and she goes and God does miracle after miracle in her life and where she thought she was after the, at the end, it was only the beginning of God's promises. It was only the beginning of blessing and overflow in your life. God, we thank you for coming into the room right now. I thank you that you didn't just send a prophet or a teacher. You sent Jesus right into the room. Jesus, I thank you that you represent the fullness of, uh, of God's plan for our lives. The full restor restor restoration package. I thank you that you are restoring those who are broken. broken. You are taking our eyes that were put on things of the world and you're bringing them back so that we could be in love with you all over again. We repent right now. If you got repenting to do just for making God common, just do that now. Just, we repent for taking it for granted your Bible, for taking for granted your word, for taking for granted your salvation, for delaying the favor of God that you've been trying to pour out on us. We repent for that. And we receive your favor right now. We receive your love all over again. We receive your salvation and we awaken to be children of the light. Children of righteousness, not of wrath. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us has never ended. We thank you that you were renewing a first love in us. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you awaken us. Here's the, the temptation in this moment is to think that you've got to go out and do something. I remember the Lord, I, I, I was repenting to him one time for not getting in the word, not, not, not being as vigilant with my relationship with him as I once had. And I said, it's just been harder. And I just don't know how to, I don't have that same zeal that I once had. And he, he just really kindly just stopped me in the middle of my repenting heart. And he said, do you want that? I was like, yes, Lord, I want, I want that zeal, that fresh new outpouring, that hunger for you. I want a hunger for you. I know that you have come for me, but I want the heart that comes for you. 
that chases after. And he said, I was the one to do that in the beginning. I, I'm the one that can continue to do it. That it's not a work. It's not a, it's a, a mold that you've got to make. You just got to surrender yourself to him and he'll do it right now. If that's you and you're like, man, uh, ma ma make it new. I'm, I believe God's going to do that for you this morning, not because of your works, but because of the invitation to let him do everything that he wants to do in your life. So I pray that over you right now. God, I just thank you that you give us a fresh, like that 16-year-old sitting in a new car. doesn't matter. doesn't matter what the condition or the position. You've given us freedom. And I thank you that we have a hunger for you. I thank you that we have a hunger for your word. We have a, a, a desire to share your love with others. God, I thank you that we have a hunger to share your testimony that we would come after him, that that union with you, that freedom that we have with you would be at the highest level. The word says that the way you began your life with Christ, so therefore continue in it. So we return to you and say, we, Jesus, we choose you as Lord of our lives. And we surrender everything to the one who's given everything to us. Make crooked paths straight. God, we thank you for waking up parts of our heart that we didn't even know were asleep. Parts of our lives that we didn't even know were far from you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the impact team to come forward. Uh, if you need prayer for anything, we want to pray for you. Thanks for being with us in worship and powerful mornings. Uh, in, fi in 15 minutes, we start the next service. And um, we want to invite you to stick around for that. If you need prayer for anything, uh, just come forward and they'll, and they'll be here for you. Let me, let, let's end service like we always do. Grab the hand of the person next to you. I'm going to bless you. Everybody grab a hand. Nobody by themselves. May the Lord bless you and keep you. He makes his face to shine upon you and he is gracious to you. He lifts the countenance, the very character of who he is, and he places it upon you and he gives you shalom. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. He gives you his one and only, his very best. Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. May you grow in the gift of grace that he's given you, that empowers you to the plans and purpose that he has for you and just you. May you experience the love of the Father to an overflowing measure, so much that you have to share it with others. May your hearts be renewed to the first love, Jesus Christ, because his favor is upon you forever and ever. Amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.